Today I'd like to present a slide lecture uh, entitled Aging as Seen Through the Eyes of the Artist. I would like to give you a historical overview of how various artists throughout time have uh, utilized the elder as a major subject matter in their works of art. And I'd like to emphasize one thing that the elder has always been a major metaphor in art and will continue to be a major metaphor in art. In the ancient periods, the elder was seen as a, uh, a source of, of divine wisdom and great homage was paid to the elder in the ancient world. As we move on through civilization, we find that the youth displaces the elder as a metaphor or a subject matter in sculpture and sometimes painting, but that throughout the art history, uh, uh, the realm of art history, we will find that the elder continues to emerge back as the major subject in art, and I will try to give you a chronological view of how the elder has played a major role as a subject in the arts. I'll begin with the primitive and try to uh, move all the way through contemporary and modern art in an attempt to, uh, to dignify and to show that the elder is a primary source of subject matter for visual artists and has been used to express great uh, levels of pathos and human expression in the arts. Thank you very much and I hope you will enjoy and gain something uh, meaningful from this uh, discussion today. Thank you. The elder has always been a center of uh, of interest in art societies and cultures as far back as I can study. And in the primitive societies, the elder was held in high esteem and there was great deference paid to uh, the elders and great homage paid to senior citizenship. And consequently, we find that the center and the focus of art in the ancient primitive uh, cultures has been the elder. Here we have an example of uh, master drummers in uh, New Guinea, restretching uh, a fresh head of skin over uh, a dead master drummer's uh, uh, drum, which now becomes the abode of the, uh, the deceased person. And these drummers are collectively restretching the skin in a process known as laying on of hands in preparation for the final resting of the uh, soul of the uh, deceased. And the elders earn the position to play the drums and, and one moves in the primitive society from adolescence to adulthood through a process known as the rites of passage. And as you gain age, you also gain status. So the, uh, the elder is held in great esteem, and art seems to be centered around the elders. In the primitive society, the, uh, the art was not primarily meant for aesthetic reasons. It, it was created for reasons of sympathetic magic. In other words, art was used for magical religious purposes. It was an attempt to adjust man's position in the universe, in the order of the universe. And the order of the universe in the ancient world, intellectually, was that the earth was simply a shadow of reality and that we existed in a cyclical relationship with the planets and the environment. The earth was not necessarily the center of the universe, but a part of the universe. And in our earth, we go, th we went, we go through four distinctive cycles. We go through birth, puberty, marriage, and death. And after death, the ancient society saw that there was a transition from this plane into a, an ancestral realm. And above the ancestral realm lied a realm of the deity. And above the realm of the deity lied a realm of a monotheistic godhead. And Africans viewed that power was derived from the monotheistic god down through the deity. The deity passed its power to the ancestors 
and the ancestors passed on their power to the living. So the living in uh, African cultures and most primitive societies see that if you lose connection with your, with your elders, you have lost connection with reality because your elders stand for two things. They represent where we've come from and also where we're going. So there's great deference paid to the elders and a magical religious link with uh, the elders even when the elders have passed on to the ancestral realm. So throughout Africa, we find that sculpture is dominated by ancestral images. Wherever we see a beard on a sculpture, it represents the ancestral realm. This is a very interesting piece here called a Nomoli soapstone sculpture. It's carved by the Mindy of Sierra Leone. And it is uh, generally found uh, laid in uh, rice paddies and millet fields to uh, sanctify and consecrate the earth and to give the earth its vitality. And uh, it's a spiritual religious object among the Mindy of Sierra Leone. And once again, the beard represents ancestral rank and that the, f the form is on that level. A neighboring um, tribe of the Mindy is uh, called the Kizzi, K-I-S-S-I. -S -S -I. They live in uh, Guinea, and they have a similar uh, soapstone image called a pombo figure, or pombo sculpture. Here we have an example of a very beautiful pombo figure with an ancestral image in the center. And cloistered around the ancestral image are the images of the living. That central figure is actually a symbol of the elder, the ultimate elder, the elder who is now in the ancestral realm. That sculpture becomes a protective votive, um, a proxy kind of uh, relationship between the living and the dead and the power that lies in the ethereal realm. Also in Africa, we find great veneration paid to elders, deference paid to elders through uh, sculptural forms. Here in these Sanufo, I'm sorry, Bambara images, we have <clears throat> examples of uh, ancient elders who are personified in these twin figures. These figures represent both the male and the female, the duality of existence, the positive, the negative, the yin and the yang, and they also represent the original uh, inhabitants of the earth. And the Sanufo and the Beule and the Dogon, the Bambara, and throughout the West Coast honor ancestral figures like these as though they are alive. They, they have their own separate huts. They are spoken to with great uh, reverence. Uh, there are taboos with regards to approaching the works and they represent the protection of uh, an entire community, uh, communication of the living and the dead. Here we have other examples of these same kinds of uh, fertility uh, sculptures. Uh, they're metaphysical in uh, uh, symbolism, but they're didactic in terms of, uh, of actual meaning because the Dogon actually look at a, a sculpture like this and they can actually understand the cosmology of their people. A work like this represents the, the, uh, the oldest ancestors of the Dogon. Um, these represent the uh, splitting of the images of uh, Nomo, the original Dogon that came to the earth. We have a male and female counterpart and it's all symbolic because the male and female are splitting like an atom and they divide into eight, uh, four males, four, four females, and uh, they populate the earth. I want to point out that in this work, you will see the beard represented on both the male and the female image. And throughout Africa and the primitive world, you'll see that the beard represents ancestry. It does not necessarily uh, uh, represent age in itself, but ancestral rank. So it has something to do with uh, the power that is accumulated 
when one dies and passes on into that realm. This is another example uh, of an ancestral image among the Bambara of Mali. And here the gesture, the, the whole posture of the image is uh, noble and uh, awesome in terms of uh, its power among the people. It sits on a throne, it's, uh, it's unshakable from its position and it represents the, uh, the embodiment of age. Here among the Beule of the Ivory Coast, we see uh, what's called a wakasana, a spirit image among the, uh, the Beule of the Ivory Coast. And here we have a sculptural form with the beard, once again representing the ancestral rank. Now, one could look at this particular piece and actually identify the elder. You see clan markings on the face. You see scarification markings on the stomach and on the arms. Uh, those are identification genealogical markings which specifically identify that specific person. And uh, these works are kept in high esteem. Once again, they represent the elders and the, uh, the level at which we all hope to achieve. The beard is uh, oftentimes shown even on images of uh, children. And when the beard is shown, it simply means that that child is dead and is in the realm of the ancestor and has the same power of the elders now that he or she is in that realm. Once again, this work is created by the Beuli of the Ivory Coast. We see scarification markings on the face which identify the specific individual. Here in East Africa, age is uh, uh, honored and uh, through the arts, through the uh, clan markings, which are sometimes taken uh, from uh, genealogical marks that have been passed on through the family clans. And uh, here we actually see uh, clan markings extended from uh, weaving patterns into actual facial decorations and coloration and scarification. And one has to earn those uh, markings and earn the ability or the right to wear them. And one uh, gains status with age in most African societies. Here we see an elder Makandi man with uh, scarification marks that he has been uh, wearing since his puberty uh, period. Uh, the rites of passage uh, is generally the time in which scarification markings or clan markings are generally applied. And he wears this with great dignity and pride. And this is a status symbol among the Makandi. And the elders are venerated and are held in great esteem. This is more than, um, than symbols of beauty, but symbols of status. Here in Liberia, we see a rites of passage ceremony being conducted. And the young girl here is moving through dance steps and hearing incantations and uh, actually gleaming wisdom from elder women who will stay with her for several months in the bush, uh, at which time wisdom will be passed on from the elders to the youth in an oral fashion. Wisdom is generally transferred from the mouths of the elders to the ears of the youth in Africa, and art plays a great part. The body is disguised here because it symbolizes the death of the puberty era, or I'm sorry, of the adolescence, and the birth and the awakening of this adulthood period, which will lead to uh, senior citizenship. White in Africa, by the way, is used symbolically as a sign of death, and black in Africa is symbolic of rebirth and life. And here you see that the face is whitewashed, and sometimes the lips and the, uh, the lobes and the temples are blackened to indicate that the person's uh, youth is dead, the adulthoodness is becoming, and the person will now speak a new language, speak and think as an adult, and act as an adult in the society. 
So there is great uh, deference paid to, uh, to age, and one moves toward age in a uh, systematic fashion in an African and primitive society. Age uh, was a, a great topic among the Greeks as well. We generally see that <clears throat> classical Greece was primarily interested in youth and the youthful body, uh, the powerful, strong, youthful body. But during the Hellenistic period, around uh, second or third century BC, we see a radical departure from this canon of absolute beauty uh, in uh, anatomical uh, structures. Because the Hellenistic artists during this period began to uh, distort the images. They still maintain the strong uh, body posture, but the faces began to become a little more grotesque and exaggerated, and it seems that during this period, the elder became the, the topic for the face or the, the major metaphor for the, uh, the sculpture. And we almost see a detachment in uh, logic between a very youthful, strong body and somewhat elder face. There is a somewhat of a distortion here, where as this is classical Greece here, where you have a youthful, a youthful face, youthful body, and everything seems to be handled around or centered around the youth. But now in this Hellenistic period, the elder becomes a, a topic of study for the artist. And <clears throat> the, classes, the, the classical uh, period was shifted by this emphasis because many people felt, many critics felt that this was grotesque that it uh, had broken the canons and laws of grace and, and, and beauty by dealing with this uh, reality. And there was a lot of contradiction uh, and controversy at this particular period in art uh, as to uh, this new expressive approach. This is the uh, detail of the Leo Kuhn group, a gigantic marble sculpture that was uh, discovered in Rhodes. And this is the face of Leo Kuhn. You can see uh, that he is in a state of agony and torture, but there is a grandeur and a grace about the, uh, the sculpture that will have his, uh, an effect on sculpture and art all the way through the, uh, the 20th century. You'll see later in our discussions that uh, this expression will be uh, very influential on on Michelangelo's expression and will be fundamental to uh, the expression of Rembrandt and, and the uh, Baroque artists and will come back once again when we uh, examine 20th century art. It seems that there is a, an emphasis on breath and life and uh, uh, dying and death and dignity and uh, this expression brought a new pathos, a new depth of emphasis uh, in art, and it began in European art in about the second or third century BC. And here's another example of the, uh, the elder head attached to a very youthful body. And uh, this is a uh, bust of a philosopher uh, from the Hellenistic period, third century BC. And once again, you see that the artists of this period are now examining age and depth of personality and strength of uh, interaction with life. And the wrinkles and the distortions now become a source of great beauty. The elder essentially becomes the hero of this period, whereas the elder in the, uh, the ancient eras and in the primitive society was looked upon as a, a god image. Here we have the elder as the hero. This is all occurring in the Hellenistic period, um, second, third century BC. This is atypical of some of the radical approaches uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in sculpture during this period. Once again, where the grotesque and age, and uh, even in this particular case, uh, disease becomes a uh, prominent 
uh, element of study by sculptors. And uh, it was what was considered a radical departure from the grace and grandeur of, uh, of uh, classical Greek art, but it was a strength that uh, led art to another plateau and a greater plateau. Now we're talking about human pathos and expression through the arts, and the elder, once again, uh, is the subject of that. We see this uh, continuing on, the, uh, the fact that the elder is a major theme and uh, a major subject in uh, painting. We see this expressed in uh, da Vinci's work and his early studies. This is the uh, Adoration of the Magi, done 1481 through 1482 by Leonardo da Vinci. And you see that, uh, once again, he uses the elder as a major subject um, in the composition because it is through examination of these faces that we actually get the pathos and the depth of uh, sensibility in the composition. It is not so much centered around the youthfulness of the Madonna nor the child, but once again, the elders become a major part of this subject matter. This is extended on uh, by Michelangelo in the, uh, the Renaissance. Michelangelo once again depicts the female as young and youthful and the husband, the male, uh, as an elder. There is a great age departure between the holy family couple here. In the background, we have more Greek and um, Greco-Roman images of youth, but the, uh, the male here is centered around an uh, elder face, and uh, age plays a very strong part in bringing a dominant harmony in the whole composition. In his uh, Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo once again adopts the elder as the uh, major form in the, uh, the composition. Adam and Eve uh, in the expulsion from the garden are represented as youth, but as we examine details of the uh, Sistine Chapel, we find that the elder begins to play a, a dominant role in the configurations. Here we see St. Peter um, depicted in the composition once again with the a face of an elder and the body of a very strong youth. Saint uh, Jeremiah, or Jeremiah here in uh, uh, the Sistine Chapel, once again, uh, the pathos of age, but the body of a, of a strong youth. A lot of this was derived from the fact that uh, Michelangelo was using his uh, self-portrait, which he did uh, after the age of 70, uh, for many of the configurations in the Sistine Chapel. And so you can see the effects of the artist's image of himself playing in his own work. And he represented himself at an age of experience and, and in his senior years. This uh, approach of uh, using the elder uh, is carried on into the 17th century. In this uh, marble bust by Bernini, we see again the elder as the subject and uh, the depth of pathos that can be uh, captured through experience. And the beauty of the face is hinged around um, the age and the experience that comes from age. The eyes represent wisdom, foresight. Da Vinci, or I'm sorry, Michelangelo, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Rembrandt, also was obsessed uh, with uh, capturing the, uh, the transition of, of time in his own portrait. And he studied himself in uh, numerous uh, compositions and numerous self-portraits. And here we see a variety of the portraits which 
uh, Rembrandt painted of himself ranging from 1622 on your uh, 1629 on the right all the way through 1639 uh, on the uh, the bottom and uh, he studied himself uh, in different poses but you can see his aging process taking uh, place actually in his own work the pathos becomes deeper with age This is Rembrandt in his uh, mid-period, when he was approximately 50 years old. This is Rembrandt in his uh, 60s. And this is his final portrait of himself as an old man. And you can see the depth of the pathos is, is, is tremendously strong in the work. And his increased use of shadows and... Uh, the simplicity of the, uh, the light in the work ref reflect a mastery of his style and a maturity of an idea that he pursued all of his career. Rembrandt was an interesting painter in that uh, he was living in the uh, Netherlands at a time uh, that brought him into conflict with his uh, creative genius. He was highly influenced by what was going on in the, in the uh, Catholic uh, nations. He was influenced by what was going on in uh, uh, French and Italian art, particularly the, uh, the, the work of uh, Car uh, Caravaggio and Annabali Caracci uh, had a great effect on him. But in the 17th century, there were two philosophical views going on in Europe, and he was involved with Protestantism, and Italy was involved with Catholicism. And uh, the Catholics in uh, Europe used art differently than the, uh, the Protestants. And we see that light and dark in, uh, in, the, in the Catholic Church represented light winning over darkness, good winning over evil. And it was a, a metaphysical and uh, symbolic element that was used. In the Netherlands, clarity was a sign of God because God was seen manifest in light. Therefore, God was omnipotent and clarity was the rule. Rembrandt was uh, uh, noted as a group portrait painter so his portraits were judged on their clarity because each individual who had his uh, composition painted in his portraits was uh, <clears throat> required to pay an equal sum and they wanted clarity of image. When uh, we, we find Rembrandt coming back from Italy and uh, having had a profound influence from the, uh, the work of Caravaggio we see that he begins to adopt the deep shadow into his work and this obscurity of uh, part of the face and the glowing of light on one side of the image caused him to run into philosophical problems in uh, the Netherlands and as a result uh, this technique lost him a lot of uh, patronage. His uh, famous composition, The Night Watch, was the uh, composition which actually brought the controversy to the public eye and uh, consequently Rembrandt uh, lived out the last portion of his life primarily doing etchings and not paintings because he couldn't sell these compositions that uh, dealt with light and shadow to this intensity but he continued to paint himself in that light because he felt that it brought out a stronger spiritual ebb and you see that he concentrates on his wrinkles, his age, and his experiences as is seen through his face. This is a uh, self-portrait of Van Gogh <clears throat> after he uh, had uh, cut his ear off. He was in uh, an insane asylum at this particular point, and he was doing uh, paintings during the last part of his life. But here we see the most provoking, provocative portrait, uh, self-portrait of an artist. Um, 
deep introspection, at the height of his uh, technical development and bringing about a composition um, that has universal value. He is not at his uh, elder period yet, but he has gained experiences that are equivalent to the, to the elder. This is uh, <clears throat> the work of uh, a symbolist, mystic uh, painter called uh, Edvard Munch. Uh, he was a German expressionist, uh, or painted in the German expressionist school, although he was from Norwegia. Uh, but he created compositions that really dealt with pathos uh, through age. He did two compositions here called Jealousy, showing uh, elder individual uh, passion, showing the elder's passion for younger love and the jealousy that's felt because the young love is, is in love with a younger man. And he examines that uh, consistently in uh, several paintings. It's believed that the, uh, the image is a portrait of himself and that this is actually a living experience of being in love with a younger woman as an older man and having this inherent jealousy of a younger man. Here is another composition by Munch. Uh, which is called Melancholia, painted in 1900. And here he's examining loneliness that comes through uh, the aging process and the fact that um, age can bring about rejection and rejection can bring about uh, melancholy and loneliness. Another German Expressionist uh, artist who examined age and the pathos of death and, uh, was uh, an artist named Kolwitz, Kathy Kolwitz. And she examines death and dying and uh, aging in a very, very deep manner. She's examining it through uh, drawings and paintings. These are compositions. Uh, examining death and motherhood. At the, at the turn of the century, we find that the French painters begin to get involved more and more with mysticism, death and dying, uh, the Mysteries of Death, and here we find a beautiful composition by Henri Rousseau called The Sleeping Gypsy, which uh, examines the, uh, the pathos of age, death and dying, and the mystical world. Now this is right on the brink of radical changes in the art world at the turn of the century. Up until this point, the artists had been wrestling with the, uh, the concepts of reality through uh, Greco-Roman art. And in the uh, latter part of the 19th century, we find uh, Picasso, we find Matisse, Duran, Vlaminck, uh, Salvatore Dali, and many artists experimenting with new approaches to reality. And these artists in the turn of the century go back to the primitive to find their new motif. Picasso ushers in the uh, 20th century um, with a style known today as Cubism by literally going back to the primitive society and going back to the, uh, to the, uh, the African masks, the Oriental mask and so forth to derive a new um, position on the human form. And with this new position comes a, a, another great move toward the elder and uh, the, uh, uh, the age becomes a factor in the pathos of the art. Freud plays a great part in this whole uh, development during this time as well because Freud opens up the, I the idea that <clears throat> the artist is not 
always painting from a uh, topical intellectual point of reference that the artist is oftentimes working from a primordial frame of reference and that images are coming out of your DNA and out of your, your inner subconscious mind that uh, one needs to understand and control and can control. It's almost an, a form of sympathetic magic whereby if you can uh, project the image, you can control it and you can manipulate even your dream world if you can at least get a, an image of it out of, your, out of your mind and onto something permanent. And Freud plays a great part and has a dynamic influence on the artists who come after him, uh, after his uh, discoveries. The dream world starts playing a major part in the art of Salvatore Dali. It opens up a new school called Surrealism. Uh, and the artists start working from their dream world. Uh, there are two schools of surrealism that developed during this uh, turn of the century. One is called veristic surrealism, which primarily comes from the dream world and includes uh, recognizable human images. And the other is absolute realism, somewhat of the, uh, in the style of, say, Paul Clay, uh, who actually work with uh, symbols more so than representational images. And these symbols are primordial images that come out of, um, of an unknown past or a subconsciousness. This is a work by Salvatore Dali called Dream. And once again, in this whole series of works, uh, we see Salvatore Dali once again analyzing age and uh, the uh, senior citizen becomes a major part of the composition. This composition here uh, is called Slave Market and Apparition of Voltaire and Bust. So we have uh, the image of the slave market and the apparition of Voltaire happening in the background and you see once again the elder becomes the center of reference here. And in this whole configuration here, we see uh, the image of a mask. These arches become the eyes. This becomes the nose of the mask. And there is an overt uh, uh, image here, which is very symbolic of the ancient mask, once again, an ancestral realm, looking into the future through the eyes of the elder. He goes on to create this composition called Crepuscular Old Man. It was highly influenced by his uh, interest in Freud and the dream world and dying and obsession with dying. And he creates this uh, very dramatic composition of an elder bent but not broken in a realm of his own, in a world of his own. It's believed that that portrait may have been stimulated or uh, influenced by Daly's uh, great involvement, emotional involvement with his father. He painted this composition, a portrait of his father, approximately the same time. And here we see Daly at at a more formal stage of painting, but still being bringing pathos and energy to the, the head of that uh, configuration, his father being able to, uh, to bring us close to uh, the mystery of his love for his dad and the strength of his age. Here we see a very interesting portrait of another surrealist painter of the same era his name is Di Carico, and here Carico um, uh, projects himself as the elder. Uh, you see wisdom and strength and experience in the face, and he creates it in, um, in his contemporary style, which was uh, surrealism, where he deals with the elements in a, uh, a dreamlike fashion. Another great French surrealist of the same period was Magritte. 
and uh, Magritte, Magritte uh, dealt with the mysteries of death and dying and the dream world as well. Age, once again, becomes a factor and he uses uh, an elder in most of his compositions. He actually creates himself in this derby, uh, derby cap or derby hat. You see that image uh, as a personification of his uh, self-portrait. In America, the American artists began to examine <clears throat> a new genre about the uh, turn of the century. And one of the uh, pioneers in this uh, new approach to um, common, everyday, ordinary subject matter as a theme in art was spearheaded by such artists as uh, Henry O. Tanner, one of the uh, uh, students of Thomas Aikens, uh, who actually uh, became one of the uh, premier romanticist painters of uh, America. Uh, Henry O. Tanner was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he is known to be one of the uh, major black journeyman artists of the 19th and turn of the 20th century. He actually gave up his citizenship in the United States and uh, became an expatriate and lived and died in uh, Paris because at the time of his uh, creation of these works, he had a very difficult time actually getting them uh, exhibited in the United States because of racial barriers, um, de facto racial barriers that still existed in this era. The image of a black man uh, in a normal, humane situation was almost taboo in the arts before Thomas Aikens and uh, Robert Henry and some of the artists of the uh, 20s and 30s began to dignify the, uh, the black man as a human being. But up until this point, the black image was uh, controlled as a Sambo image and uh, any attempts to dignify it went against the social codes. Henry O. Tanner tried to dignify that he tried to select the, the black peasant, the elder, passing on wisdom from the elder to the youth, the same African uh, uh, concept of, uh, of uh, extended family relationships uh, was playing out here. And he did this composition called The Banjo Lesson in 1893. And it was somewhat rejected in the United States and could not be shown in major exhibitions and so forth. And he got so disgusted with uh, attempting to uh, uh, present his work here that he left the United States and went to Paris where he had a more receptive audience. When he went to Paris, he began to paint religious themes, but he continued to use the elder as a subject in his work. Here in this composition called The Thankful Poor, we see him once again showing the youth gaining information from the elder, and the elder is a role model for the youth, and the dignity and respect and deference that is uh, personified in, uh, in the composition says a whole lot. Well, he left the United States and he went to Paris and um, he lived and died there and became a French immortal. But this whole concept of uh, a newfound interest in uh, portraiture and uh, people of uh, common background and the elder as a subject in art, uh, the indigent, uh, became a profound uh, approach for American painters. Uh, it was advocated by uh, people like Thomas Aikens who believed that American artists should paint the scenes around them, paint the things that they knew the most stop imitating European art and start painting the American genre and uh, make expressions that uh, were reality instead of uh, these metaphysical things from the past. And it led artists such as uh, Robert Henry and um, many of the Ashcan school painters to start examining things right around them. They started 
examining uh, uh, their relatives, the aged and their families, and painting them with great dignity and respect, and showing that uh, age is beauty, not ugliness, and that there is great pathos that can be brought to a composition by actually capturing the energy and the beauty of the, of the elder. These are portraits uh, done by uh, Saul, or, 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 or by Bellows, George Bellows. This is uh, George Bellows's aunt, Fanny, done in 1920. Here is another composition by George Bellows, done in 1921. Um, this is a portrait of the artist's mother. And once again, you see it uh, presented with great dignity and nobility. And um, there's great grace in her face. And the age projects great wisdom. Leger in the 1920s uh, paints a provocative uh, a portrait of his uncle that uh, brings age once again to a, a level of great dignity and wisdom. Alfred Stiglitz uh, in 1922 does this uh, profound portrait of Charles de Muth and uh, once again captures uh, a deep, provoking sense of pathos in the face, the lines, the agony the introspection of age. American regionalists in the 1930s uh, began to examine age and uh, the elder once again in America. And here we see in uh, Grant Wood's uh, American Gothic done in 1930, uh, a fresh interpretation of, uh, of the elder. The elder is a dominant theme in the composition. He's making a profound statement here about pride and dignity. Here we have uh, pride and dignity in the face, holding on to the pitchfork, the reflection of the pitchfork in his um, undergarment, and the support of the wife. But uh, you see a uh, dominant presence here of the male in front of the female and the wife supportive of the male through his work and the farmhouse in the background. This was atypical of Grant Wood's statement about the peasant, and the farmer, and the dignity of the farmer, and the dignity of age. Here in, uh, is another composition by Grant Wood called Woman with Plants, also done in 1930s. And, uh, we see him examining age in great detail and bringing uh, a sense of grace uh, to age. Also in the 1930s, uh, many photographers uh, began to examine uh, age and poverty. And uh, here we have the work of Ben Sean in 1935 showing a family of, reset of the resettlement administration in the 1930s. And uh, here we, we see not so much age but poverty and the fact that poverty brings on age. And uh, you can see that this lady may be in her 30s but uh, the toll of poverty uh, is shown in her body. And again, the deep pathos in the face and this great uh, responsibility that she bears for the children and the condition of her times. It's all shown here and captured. Uh, here we have a beautiful, uh, a famous composition by Russell Lee, a photographer done in 1939 called Tenant Purchase. Um, he was a photographer of, of the uh, Farm Security Administration, which uh, the FSA, it was called, was established in 1930 and was uh, abolished in 1943. And many photographers uh, 
had commissions to actually capture the American um, population through photography. And many of the uh, photographers who had those commissions during this period centered their energy once again on the, the elderly and the dignity of the elderly, even in the face of this poverty that was going on at the time. This uh, concept of, um, of uh, examination of the elders uh, continues on in the work of the Ashcan painters of the 1930s. We see uh, Reginald Marsh uh, in, uh, in a composition called Why Not Use the L, uh, showing the elder as the indigent, um, the elder as a lonely, perhaps, uh, individual in fear in the, in the real world, somewhat uh, disoriented by the circumstances of the time. But he examines the elder as a major metaphor in his work. Also in the 1930s, uh, we find the great painter Archibald Motley uh, creating a composition called Mending Socks. And here, I think this must be either the mother or an elder aunt of Archibald Motley sitting in a room with all of her possessions, somewhat in a state of loneliness, uh, deep introspection, but great dignity, and uh, once again, pathos in the face. Ivan Albright, in his self-portrait, 1930 ushers in a new form of American realism called uh, social, so, uh, social surrealism. And here he goes another dimension into the uh, aging process. He actually carries the aging process to its uh, almost bizarre level. He goes into a microscopic view of uh, wrinkles and uh, detail, and as a result, he he presents a uh, strength of character and uh, an expression that uh, one never forgets. In this self-portrait, we see dignity, we see fear, we see all of the anxieties of age. Uh, he examines it to a, a level that is sometimes frightening to the observer. Here is a... Uh, Another composition by uh, Ivan Albright, done in 1930s, called Fleeting Time. Here, once again, he's examining uh, age, and the fear of age and uh, aging, and the loneliness that sometimes comes with the aging process. But once again, he shows a strength in the character and a dignity even in, uh, in the state that is uh, overwhelming and very powerful in terms of visual effects. Another composition by Ivan Albright done in uh, 1934 called The Farmer's Kitchen uh, once again shows great energy and pathos, the exaggeration of the aging process to bring about a greater understanding of the dignity that lies in this. The hands, the, um, the integration of the, uh, the wrinkles into the patterns and wallpaper design and so forth uh, carries the eye visually into the detail of the composition and you forget the portrait so much as you do, uh, you, you forget the portrait and you get involved in the rhythm of the patterns and designs. And he says in this effect that the wrinkles in the skin are part of the patterns of life and should not be seen necessarily as something repulsive, but something that is stamped by nature and time. And he goes on to examine death and dying and uh, uh, many of his compositions move uh, into, back into the surrealist uh, mode of expression where the dream world and the otherworldly images become a dominant motif in his work. 
This uh, composition done in 1940 is called That Which I Should Have Done, showing uh, uh, a door with a reef, perhaps uh, the door of a crypt or a mausoleum, uh, the final calling of death, going through the final passages of life and so forth is all exemplified in, uh, metaphysically in these compositions. Here is another death and dying uh, uh, doorway moving through the passages of life. And this is called Door Room, Door Room. And it was done in 1942 by Ivan Albright. Here is a work by William H. Johnson uh, called Man in Vess. And here William H. Johnson is uh, examining uh, the, uh, the aged and he's also um, projecting the dignity that can come through the aging process and that uh, pride and dignity and strength of character and so forth can be best shown through that experience. Now, William H. Johnson adopts uh, more of a Cubist style of presentation of his images. He's creating these in the 1940s, but he brings a fresh interpretation of the elder back to the arts through a Cubistic fashion. Charles White, a major black painter in the 1950s, uh, utilized his mother as the theme for most of his compositions. This composition here called uh, My Mother uh, shows the dignity of age, the dignity and uh, closure that comes with, uh, with knowing that you've lived your life and you've lived your life as best you could and that you have survived and that you see greater horizons is all expressed in his work. It gives great hope to those in poverty and to those who still have hope for a greater world and a greater future. In this composition also by Charles White, we see Charles White presenting his mother uh, and the composition is called Take uh, My Mother Home, done in 1950. Once again, showing a deference of the youth for the elders and the fact that the elders represent such great knowledge and experience that uh, to lose that connection is to lose something more precious than, uh, than life. This is Benny Andrews' um, composition that he did of his mother and father. And here, once again, we see an attempt to dignify them in their in their old age and to, uh, to pay homage to the elders and to express a certain nobility and a sense of, of uh, wisdom accumulated by that age. I can think of no other, I can think of no greater painter in the United States than Andrew Wyeth when it, uh, with regards to examining the aging process and bringing um, universal dignity to the aged. Andrew Wyeth uh, was a master of realism and he was very interested in examining uh, human energy and human pathos in his work and he was able to do it with a uh, style and flair of uh, no other artist in the United States. Here we have a composition called Becky King. Becky King was done in 1940s. He brings such great dignity in this simple drawing of Becky King. He brings out the dignity, the age, the, um, the mystery, of life, uh, you sense um, some anxiety in the face. Uh, she's staring off into uh, 
the unknown. She's thinking. You can feel that this woman has uh, had great experience and is contemplating perhaps uh, her final days. But it seems as though she's reminiscing um, memories of the past. But he brings out such strength and dignity in the composition that is literally overwhelming. We go on to see that age is actually uh, exemplified even in the blowing of the curtain through the window in this composition called uh, Open Window, Wind from the Sea, done in 1947, also by Andrew Wyeth. Age is indicated here. The tattered curtains, the wind blowing in, represents loneliness, the uh, tattered shade, the darkened room, the empty landscape, all express uh, elements related to gerontology and the loneliness and the abandonment that uh, is often felt by the aged. He pursues this even further through his portraits. Here in this uh, portrait of, uh, of Carrie, done in the 1940s, he examines the dignity of a man in his uh, mid and early senior citizen era, uh, reflecting on his life in a cold and empty room, perhaps lonely, looking back at a past, looking forward to um, perhaps more loneliness, uh, deep introspection in the face of this individual and captured um, to the nth degree by Andrew Wyeth's great care for detail and expression. Here is a, uh, another composition by Andrew, Andrew Wyeth, Man from Maine, done in 1951. Here again is a senior citizen Rendered lonely, left alone in a blank white room, staring out of a window, once again reminiscing about the past in his mind, perhaps worrying about the present and contemplating the future. But the stillness, the calmness, the grace, the dignity, the passion and pathos that he uh, can project through the simplest presentation of the, f of the figure is awesome. Here he examines uh, the face of Anna Christina in 1967. Here we can see uh, her life expressed in her face, the strength and character, the loneliness perhaps, but the dignity is all captured in this composition. And once again, Andrew Wyeth captures it in photographic detail. But most importantly, he singles out the elder as his subject matter. And here in Garrett's room, he captures death and dying and loneliness, detachment, departure, um, rejection, everything is captured in this composition. We don't know whether the man is dead or alive, but we do feel the, the presence of the room, the, the solitaire, loneliness of an elder in an attic, alone, perhaps dying or perhaps dead. And in this final work, uh, we see Maria Johnson called in a composition called Silver Circle, done 1970. And she's examining poverty and old age and the fear of uh, being unable to exist in a world that's constantly threatening the elders placing the elders in an endangered species in retirement and in the economic factors that they have to face, the loneliness and rejection and poverty. 
but she still, she still shows the dignity and the respect and the, the, the hope, the will expressed in the, uh, in the composition. And we, we sense an organization even in the state of poverty with the tight circle around the figure. There is still a closure, a tight closure and strength and hope in the face. And she's smiling because she has hope and still looking forward to a brighter future and a brighter world. And this last composition um, called The Wanderer by Gross represents uh, the elder at the ultimate state of simply going back to nature, following nature, forgetting the man-made world for a moment and just wandering and relaxing in nature in his solitude, the mantle of solitude, whether it be madness, um, whether it be illness, whether it be loneliness, rejection, pain, man still has his final moment in nature. And in essence, what this composition is saying is that life is what you make of it. And the answer really is in your hand. And the bird can either be dead or alive. If it's in your hand, it just depends on whether you let it go or whether you squeeze it to death. I would hope that the artist can help awaken all of us to a greater responsibility that we all have uh, in our modern society and in civilization to never lose scope of the fact that our elders are important and that it is absolutely ridiculous for us to throw away our elders when in fact we are becoming them. I mean, we should at least be selfish enough to build a better world for ourselves, if not for our children and for those who have brought us into existence. To, to throw the elders uh, on the trash heaps of society is like burning down our libraries and burning down our research and uh, burning up our resources for tomorrow because we do not exist in a vacuum and this cosmetic attitude that we take on youth is erroneous because we only earn our right to become elders. And if we're still healthy and strong and loved as elders, we can make just as profound of contributions back to mankind as we can if, if we're in our maximum youth. And that there is experience in age and beauty in age, but there is also loneliness in age and fear in age that can be corrected in a civilization that has enough sense to honor its richest resource. Thank you very, very much.